everyone. Now we're going to talk about some R functions for hypothesis testing. And good news, you've already seen a lot of this work if you've watched my, uh, or seen a lot of this code already if you watch my videos on constructing confidence intervals, since the functions responsible for hypothesis testing are generally the functions that you're using for constructing confidence intervals. So pat yourself on the back. A lot of the work has already been done. Uh, so uh, the when, when dealing with these functions, let's revisit that parameter alternative. I told you before that the, uh, the uh, parameter alternative should be understood as talking about uh, alternative hypotheses in hypothesis testing. Well, here we are. We're talking about hypothesis testing, and what do you know? Uh, the alternative parameter is going to be either uh, two-sided, greater, or less, depending on what the alternative hypothesis is, and you've already seen what those alternative hypotheses uh, could be. So you're just going to set whether you want uh, mu less than mu naught, mu not equal to mu naught, mu greater than mu naught. This, cor this option corresponds to the two-sided case, this corresponds to less, and this corresponds to greater. Aside from that, there's probably a parameter that you need to set, such as uh, you probably need to set mu equals whatever you want the null hypo the mean of the null hypothesis to be. So in the case of t-test, you might need to set a parameter corresponding uh, to the parameter for which you're testing. Uh, but other than that, it's uh, pretty similar to what you were already doing uh, so these R functions are going to report uh, the results of statistical tests. They'll give you p-values. You will. They won't actually give you the results of a decision. It's up to you to read the p-value and then to decide whether to reject the null hypothesis or not. Um, but otherwise, they'll give you uh, point estimates and even confidence intervals. And also, uh, this is not something they're going to talk about too much here, but the reason why... Uh, the alternative parameter also changes the type of um, uh, confidence interval being reported is because there is actually a connection between confidence intervals and hypothesis testing, where the confidence interval can be thought of as uh, containing all of the mean po uh, potential mean values under the null hypo hypothesis for which you would not reject the null hypothesis, uh, for which, oh my gosh, that is a total word salad. Um, let me try that again. A confidence interval can be understood as containing all of the potential mu naught for which you would not reject the null hypothesis. So if your mu naught that you actually specified in your hypotheses actually is outside of the interval, then that means that you should reject the null hypothesis for that mu naught. That is the connection uh, between hypothesis testing, and um, uh, confidence intervals. Oh, and I should also probably mention that your level alpha is going to be 1 minus your confidence level. So that's why there's a connection between the two. Uh, but R is very nice in giving you uh, some confidence intervals as well. All right, so uh, type 2 error analysis. R does provide uh, some, or actually the stats package does provide some functions for type 2 error analysis. Uh, this is a difficult analysis in general. There are other packages devoted exclusively to uh, study design because type 2 error analysis is a, is a part of study design. It's not something that you do after uh, collecting data and computing statistics and all that stuff. This is something that you do prior to collecting any data. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that later in a different video. Uh, for now, let's just talk about conducting hypothesis tests. So um, our first example is test for the pop, uh, for the location of population mean. We're going to do so by using the t-test. The t-test is meant for data that is normally distributed, but the t-test also seems to work fairly well when your sample size is large in general. Okay, so we're going to do the t-test uh, for uh, the data set that we saw earlier. Once again, we're going to decide that we want alpha to be 0.05. Why 0.05? Because I said so. I have my reasons. I feel like it. Um, well, my reasons are I just feel like it, right? There's there's no deeper reason than that. Uh, so here is a QQ plot. Uh, I want to promote this. Okay, so uh, here's a QQ plot. It seems that the normality assumption is reasonable for the tree growth uh, data set. 
so we do a t-test. We're going to set the parameter mu equal 12 to signify that under the null hypothesis, the true mean is equal to 12. So uh, by default, the alternative hypothesis is that the true mean is not equal to 12. So that means that by default, the alternative parameter is uh, two-sided. So if we wanted to, we could change alternative, what was the point estimate, 13? So we could say uh, alternative equals greater and get a different uh, alternative hypothesis. So here is the p-value. We can read the p-value. We can enjoy the p-value. If we want, we can extract the p-value uh, like so. And yeah, you, you can work with it. We've talked about the objects that are created by t-test before. You, it's not very clear from this printout, but that's because R is actually hiding the fact that this is a list. So that list has components in it. Actually, let's go ahead. Uh, let's go ahead and examine the list a bit more closely. So, uh, so it's a list. Uh, the reason why it's not being printed as a list is because the class attribute has been set. I'm not going to really talk about that here, but it gives the name of the data set that we put in, uh, what type of test we did, the alternative, uh, the standard error of the statistic that was estimated, um, the value under the null hypothesis, that's null.value, uh, the estimated value, uh, we've already talked about confidence intervals, but the p-value, uh, the parameter corresponds to the degrees of freedom and the statistic, that's the test statistic that we computed. So it gives you all of that stuff. You could extract any one of those things if you wanted to. For example, we could do, uh, we could get the statistic uh, and, and we get it. And that's going to be the case for a lot of these uh, test statistic functions or hypothesis testing functions. All right. Um, all right. Next one. Uh, test for value of a proportion. In this situation, uh, we are our null hypothesis says that for some binom some Bernoulli data set, the true uh, parameter p, which corresponds to the probability of getting a one, the true p is equal to p naught. And under the alternative, the true p is either less than p naught, it's not equal to p naught, or it's greater than p naught. So we could invoke the central limit theorem to uh, justify using the test statistic p hat minus p naught divided by the square root of p naught times one minus p naught over n. And it's kind of funny in this situation because if you know, if you knew, in fact, that uh, the true proportion was p naught, then this is going to be the standard error of the statistic p hat. So that means that under the null hypothesis, you actually know what sigma is. So you get to plug that in, and under the null hypothesis, this test statistic should follow a normal distribution. If the null hypothesis is not true, then it's not following a standard normal distribution. It's probably doing something else. Um, so it's going to be off in that the standard error is not going to be quite right if the null hypothesis is false. But if the null hypothesis is true, then at least approximately, due to the central limit theorem, the distribution of this test statistic should be a standard normal distribution. The function that you're going to want to use for this is going to be the prop test function. You're going to give it the, the number of successes and the size of the study, and then you're going to set the parameter P to the value of P naught under the null hypothesis. So uh, let's go ahead and try this out. Uh, we are, uh, can, again, this uh, these notes were written in 2016. So it was Hillary Clinton who was running against Donald Trump as opposed to, well, right now, uh, the Democratic nominee or the presumptive nominee is going to be Joe Biden. Uh, so if you want, substitute Hillary Clinton with Joe Biden. So in this fictitious survey of 1,118 participants, 562 favored Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden, I don't know, uh, over Donald Trump. So I want to test whether the candidates are tied or whether, or whether Hillary Clinton is winning. So I'm just going to say that supporting Hillary Clinton counts, counts as a success. So since I'm counting it as a success, then, then that means that the number of success in the sample is going to be 562. The alternative is going to be greater since I'm interested only in one direction. I'm not just interested in whether the true proportion is 0.5 or not. I'm interested in whether Hillary Clinton is winning. That corresponds to, be, to P being greater than 0.5. So I say alternative is greater, and I set P to the value uh, 
of P under the null hypothesis, which is 0.5. So then I conduct the test. Here's the results. The P value is 0.44. Uh, which is certainly greater than any reasonable alpha. So we're not going to reject the null hypothesis that the two are tied or P is equal to 0.5. Uh, uh, suppose your sample though is not large enough to use the above procedure. In this case, the sample size was 1,118. Uh, that is certainly large enough to invoke the central limit theorem and use the uh, results um, and use basically this test. But if that is not the case um, and your sample size is small, you should not use this procedure. Instead, you should understand the number of successes in your sample. Uh, you should view that as being a binomial random variable for which you know P under the null hypothesis. So in this example, uh, suppose you randomly select 15 friends from your Facebook friends list and you ask them their political affiliation. A success is a friend whose political views agree with yours. I'm going to say that alpha is equal to 0.1 just because I want to. Uh, so for this, you would want to use the, bin the binom test function uh, setting alternative equals greater to because um, you want to test whether... Uh, the number of friends uh, sharing your views is going to be 0.5 or greater than 0.5. So whether the majority of your Facebook friends agree with you or not. Uh, so here we had 10 out of 15 friends agreeing with us. The results of binom test, uh, we get a p-value of 0 0.1509, which means that we should not reject the null hypothesis that... Um, uh, that uh, we should not reject the null hypothesis that the that the true proportion is 0.5. Okay, and I should also probably mention this: when you choose one of these one-sided alternatives, implicitly the null hypothesis becomes p less than or equal to in the case of p greater than p naught, or basically it will take the opposite direction, including equality. So if you chose H a to be p less than p naught, implicitly the null hypothesis is p greater than or equal to p naught. The only reason why we say P equals P naught is because we always choose the proportion or we always choose the parameter value on the boundary of the region corresponding to the null hypothesis being true. So we're always going to choose P equal to P naught rather than a P rather than some P smaller than whatever the boundary is. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, we like we would not try out of P equals P a, which is less than P naught or greater than P naught when we're all, when our alternative is that P is less than P naught. All right. Uh, continuing on, uh, the next example, testing for differences between population means using paired data. All right. Our data is paired. We talked about paired data before when talking about confidence intervals for paired data. So, XI, for every XI, there's a corresponding YI. We want to test whether the means are the same or not. And if they're, they're not the same, it's possible that mu X is less than mu, not, mu Y, which corresponds to the difference in means being less than zero. We could have mu X be greater than mu Y, which corresponds to the difference in means being greater than zero. Or I could just have the difference in means not be zero, which means that the two means are just not the same. Uh, so for this, we compute... Uh, the the differences in the data, we subtract yi from xi, and we can do that because there's always a correspondence between these two, and then replace mu x minus mu y with mu d, and just test whether mu d is equal to zero, greater than zero, or less than zero. Um, not really much is different um, other than when using t-test, we have the parameter mu that we can set after we have set the parameter paired to true. And we could set it equal to zero to check to say under the null hypothesis, the means are the same, but otherwise everything else is going to be pretty similar to what we've been doing before. Uh, we're using again, that uh, Swedish traffic data set. So I'm going to uh, load in that data set and do all the transformations necessary to get it into an appropriate format. So um, here is the data set of accidents when the limit was strictly applied and the data set when the accident went of accidents when the limit was not strictly applied. And then I can check whether the data appears to be normally distributed. A normal distribution seems appropriate. Although I did mention before, I kind of suspect this data isn't normally distributed. It's probably Poisson distributed or something. Anyway, um, 
uh, here is the uh, uh, result the result of the test, the pair t test. We set paired equal to true, and alternative is less. And by default, mu is equal to zero. So um, since I'm only interested in whether the, the two are different or not, I'm willing to live with that default uh, mu naught. So in this case, we got a p-value that was very small, uh, smaller even than 0.001. Uh, so we should probably reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference. Okay. Uh, next up, we have the difference. We are going to test for the difference in uh, mean between uh, two independent, uh, two populations with independent samples. So this time the samples are independent of each other. Um, so we would estimate the mean difference using X bar minus Y bar. And then the question is, what is going to be the standard error of the statistic? Because we want to divide by that standard error in order to get an appropriately normalized test statistic. Well, the question then becomes, are, do the two populations have the same uh, variance or not? If their variance of this is the same, then we have homoscedasticity and we should use this test statistic. There are situations where homoscedasticity is appropriate if, in fact, your null hypothesis is not just that the means are the same, but in fact that the two samples are from the exact same population, and which would mean also that their standard deviation is the same. So this actually would be appropriate if your null hypothesis is saying something stronger than equality in means, but in fact, uh, same distribution. Um, but otherwise, unless you're saying something like that, uh, this is the test statistic that you should use in general, um, where you assume, or you're basically allowing for heteroscedasticity. You're not necessarily assuming it, you're just allowing for it. Uh, and if that's going to be the case, the degrees of freedom of this statistic is not going to be quite a t-distribution, but something resembling a t-distribution where you choose your new parameter to be this ugly business. Um, which involves uh, the standard uh, sample standard deviations for the samples and blah, 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 blah. It's an awful mess. But you don't have to worry about it because you're going to use R. Um, all right, so we want to go back to this uh, tooth growth data set and decide whether uh, the mean tooth growth length is going to be the same for the orange juice and the vitamin C group. So we're going to do so using t-test. Uh, let's scroll down down run this run this run this and then we do the t-test and we get a p-value of 0 0.03 which is suggesting that the two groups do not have uh the same mean and in fact it's probably the case that uh the mean is greater than zero which corresponds to the orange juice group having a larger mean than the vitamin c group uh we if we were Interested in doing the homoscedastic test, we could construct a box plot, examine the box plot, decide does it look like uh, the groups are have the same variance or not, or the same spread or not. In this case, it looks like it's an appropriate assumption. So we'll go ahead and use the t-test, uh, setting var equal equal to true to allow or to require homoscedasticity. Uh, we get a very similar result, so we're not going to. Um, Think too much about it but in general you're probably better off uh, simply uh assuming that the data that the two groups are uh heteroscedastic or allowing for it since uh generally you're not going to get much benefit uh from assuming homoscedasticity compared to the losses if you're incorrect all right uh the final test that we're going to consider is uh, testing for a difference in population proportions. So we have two groups of Bernoulli random variables or two groups of successes and failures. And we want to check whether the proportion of successes in the first population differs from uh, the corresponding proportion in the second population. So the null hypothesis says the two groups have the same probability of getting a success, which is the same as saying that the difference in proportions is equal to zero. Under the alternative, they're either... They're different in some way. If M and N are reasonably large, where M corresponds to the size of the data set for group two and N corresponds to the size of the data set for group one, then you can use the central limit theorem to uh, and uh, use the test statistic Z, which is the difference in the proportions. And then uh, you're going to divide by uh, 
uh, what's going to be the best estimate of the standard error under the assumption that the two groups um, uh, do not differ in proportion, in which case you actually are using a pooled sample proportion, which is going to be the number which is going to be the number of successes in the combined sample where you where you put both samples from both groups into one sample and then divide by its sample size. So under the null hypothesis, this should follow approximately a standard normal distribution after you apply the central limit theorem. The function that you want to use for conducting this test is going to be the function prop test, which we've already seen before. And in fact, the function call is pretty much the same. Uh, you're going to say uh, that, uh, well, X is going to be now a vector of successes for each group and N is going to be the two groups corresponding sample size. Uh, so here we're going to be using the melanoma data set again, tracking how many individuals, uh, have melanoma. So here is the number of females and males that have melanoma in our sample. Here are the corresponding sample sizes. And then we conduct prop test by default as checking whether the mean, the proportions are the same or not. We got a P value of 0.03. Uh, the alternative hypothesis is two sided, meaning that we're just simply checking whether the proportions are the same or not. Since our p-value is smaller than 0.05, which is our specified significance level, we are not going to reject the null hypothesis. All right, so that concludes our, my discussion on hypothesis testing um, in R. We do have a couple more topics left to discuss, um, the next one being power analysis, which is going to be important if you're planning a study. This is what you do before you collect data uh, as opposed to after you collect data. All right, so we will just talk about that next. Until then, have a good day.